A reading from the book of Isaiah. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap and fortified the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong people will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our Lord. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Please stand and read with me (coughs) Psalm 23, found on your bulletin insert. I will read up to the asterisk, and you will read the rest. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul and guides me along bright pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A reading from Paul's epistle to the Philippians. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Euodia and I urge Suntuke to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thank you. 
hymn number 663.
In the name of the living God, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer, please be seated. Many, many years ago, when I was around seven years old, one of my playmates told me a dirty joke. I know it was a dirty joke because she told me it was. <laughs> and also, she wouldn't tell it to me until we went into the bushes where nobody could hear us, and that she was so nervous when she told me the joke that I could barely hear what she was saying. But I'm not going to tell you that joke. <laughs> Not because it's dirty, but because it, by the time I heard it, it made no sense at all. <laughs> and I have remembered everything she said to this day, hoping that at some point, It works that way with the Bible also. Any, any word, any word that is passed on by oral telling, by oral telling, gets developed after it's been told many, many times. My childhood playmate, by the time she, not knowing anything about the real subject of the joke, my childhood playmate had heard it from someone who didn't fully understand it, who had heard it from someone that didn't fully understand it, and in an effort to make meaning, they added things that probably had never been there, and still it made no sense at all. Regarding the lesson, the gospel lesson from the book of Matthew, I would like to tell you that we believe that Jesus told a story about a banquet. And we know that because it, a similar story appears in the Gospel of Luke and a similar story appears in the Gospel of Thomas, the fifth Gospel that was only discovered after the Bible had been put together in the form we have it today. So we believe that he told a story about a banquet and that he compared it, in his mind, to the kingdom of God. We know that Jesus was familiar with the, with the prophecy of Isaiah, the passage from Isaiah that you heard about the great feast that God was going to give his people, about the, the marrow and the, the, the luxurious, rich food that would be shared, and how Isaiah saw that as good news of the work that God was going to do, and we can easily understand how Jesus saw that same banquet as the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. We also know that in his ministry, Jesus was concerned that not everybody invited to the kingdom of God, that he was so given to explaining that he was concerned that not everybody called accepted the invitation. And he probably was particularly concerned that the people on the so-called A-list didn't accept the invitation to the party. Matthew has taken the dinner party story and he has made it into a wedding banquet which adds an element of commitment, an element of becoming one with the king, one with Christ, one with God. And in case we would miss that, he made it a wedding for the king's son. And he has details about the killing of the people who the killing of the slaves who were sent with the message, which stands for the prophets, 
who were killed before the time of Jesus. And he sees the whole situation with, he's, what do you call that? A, yes, an allegory, but there's a sports figure, second, uh, Monday morning quarterback. He sees it as a Monday morning quarterback might see it. He brings in the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And he brings in the, the anger and antipathy, antipathy that existed between Matthew and his followers of Jesus and their fellow worshipers in the synagogues who did not accept the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. So he brings that anger in. And we think that the wedding garment that was so important, which does not appear in the other versions of this story, we think the wedding garment was probably a white robe of baptism. You know, you were baptized naked. You all know that, right? And then they you know, put a garment on you right away. So that what Matthew is seeing in the story is that if you weren't baptized, even if you followed Jesus, you still were not uh, in the kingdom, in the kingdom of God. So, Matthew has taken a story as we all do, and and shaped it, understood it to answer his own questions about what's going on. Whenever we hear any story, we are listening with a point of view. We listen. We read with an axe to grind. We want. We have questions. We're looking for how is this story going to answer my questions. And if it doesn't answer my questions, we tend to forget those things and to remember the ones, the ones that do. So Matthew is a little bit like the radio commentator now long gone, Paul Harvey, and he's giving us the rest of the story. So we also receive this living word today. And for, so for us, this kingdom banquet, we need to look at what it is for us today. One of the things that we notice in it, and this is in all three versions, that the king sends slaves out twice to call the people to the banquet. Turns out they used to do that in those days. They'd invite you to the feast, and then right before the feast, they'd send people out a second time to invite you, and the reason they did that was because people might be waiting to see who else was coming. I have a friend, I think, I, I think she's a friend, who, whenever you ask her to a party or dinner, she always says, I'm not sure. I, 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 can I get back to you about that? And we learned, her other friends, uh, that she was always holding out in case she might get a better offer. <laughs> and that's one of the things that's going on in this story. And perhaps we all hold out for a better offer. It reminds me... We hold out for a better offer even, even though the ultimate message of this story is that everybody is invited. Everybody is invited. We're not so sure that's what we want. I'm reminded of Groucho Marx, who said he would never join a country club that would let him in as a member. <laughs> All of this is important for us because we think that everybody is us. That everybody is us. Because Jesus loves us, and he does. At the clergy conference this week, we learned uh, the topic of the conference was racism. We learned about racism in new ways over the years, and I'm sure many of you um, who have lived as long as I have have heard about racism in, under any names. 
under any frameworks, many frameworks. We have many, many ways of understanding racism, and we learned a different way to understand it. At the clergy conference, we spent a lot of time learning how white privilege works. Those of you who were here a few weeks ago had heard me describe a story in which I also learned about what it is to be privileged. Those of us, those of us who are white, the dominant group here, understand that we, we assume that we are the gold standard. We are the gold standard. We are everything that is good and right and beautiful. And we're really happy about that. But we don't necessarily recognize all of the decisions and choices that we make on the basis of that assumption. We heard many examples at the conference about how this works, but I'm only going to describe one to you because it caused me to do more thinking. Have you noticed that when we talk about people of color, we often, not always, but we often refer to them as non-whites. Have you ever wondered why we don't say that we're non-black? Have you thought about why that might be? Because, because that's your prayer assignment. That's your prayer assignment for not just the coming week, but for the coming weeks. You see, I am not asking you to do anything different. I am not asking you to do anything different. When we hear about something that's not right, when we hear about something that's not working the way it should, we are generally very quick to fix the problem. Quick. What do we have to do to fix that problem? And we don't do that because we want the problem fixed. We do that because we're so uncomfortable with the problem that we would like to get rid of the pain as fast as we possibly can. My fellow clergy at the conference were, many of them, impatient and concerned. What are we going to do? Come on, tell us what we're going to do. And the message was, just take this fact in and acknowledge it. I'm not asking you to do anything different because you really can't. This is a system that we are so wound up in, so bound up in that we cannot without the help of God, step out of it. I'm just asking you to allow yourself to see things differently, to see that those of us, the non-blacks, are not the gold standard. And then, when you have become able to hold those facts, tell somebody else what you have understood. So here's the good news. The king has invited you to a banquet. And there is no better invitation in town. And it is come as you are. But be ready to learn that you are not what you think you are. And there is no such thing as an A list. And you won't get to choose the menu, the seating, nor the china, nor the music. RSVP anyway. Amen. <laughs> Let us stand and reaffirm our faith in the Nicene Creed on page 358.
The prayers of the people will be form three, found on page 387 of the Book of Common Prayer. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Rob, our bishop, and the diocesan cycle of prayer for Trinity Church Hampton, the Reverend David Robinson Vicar. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. We pray for the safety and speedy return of those departed in the armed forces and for comfort for their families. We pray for all who pray for peace worldwide. We pray for assurance and blessing for those looking for work and their families. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. We pray for healing and encouragement for Cynthia and Jim, Jeff, Lou, Kay, Ed, Carolyn, Amy, Corrine, Barb, John, Bill, Diane, Ella Rose, Mary, George, Leanne, Diana, Deborah, John, Sophia, and Judith Ann. We pray for all who face the fallout of alcohol, drug, and physical abuse, and those who love them. We pray for healing within ourselves and for those in our thoughts and hearts today. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. Remembering especially James Branscombe, Harold Chase, and from our Book of Remembrance, Sally Showalter, Raymond Lucien Lamoureux, Phyllis Ann Charamonte. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. We give thanks to you, O Lord for the yard sale and its volunteers. We give thanks for all known to us who celebrate birthdays this week, including Karen Batty, Dee Burgoyne, Vanessa Calhoun, Carter Moore, Nathaniel Sherwood, Cassidy Exner, Jared Duffy, David Betts, Bob McCann, and Andrew McKim. We give thanks for those celebrating anniversaries this week. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others.
we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. So with you.
um, the, the chips, the children, um, the incarcerated persons. This is a ministry of the <coughs> church. It is uh, a very sweet, very sweet and spirit-filled spirit <coughs> ministry. We gather, we urge you to purchase gifts, uh, new items or books, new books, unwrapped.
The Great Thanksgiving continues on page 361 in your prayer book. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature and to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be, for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. <laughs> The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith. Thanksgiving. 